the F-16 Fighting Falcon, a true air superiority fighter used by air forces around the world to keep their skies secure. It's affordable, lightweight, and built around a single engine, but don't let that fool you. It was designed to outmaneuver anything in the sky. The F-16's story actually starts during the Vietnam War. Back then, the US relied on big, complex fighters like the F-4 Phantom. These jets were fast and powerful, loaded with radar and missiles. But when it came to actual dogfighting, especially at low speeds, they were at a serious disadvantage. That's where the smaller, lighter, Soviet-designed MiG-21s came in. The Vietnamese Air Force used them to great effect. These MiGs had thin delta wings, a single engine, and were incredibly agile. While the F-4 could hit speeds of Mach 2.2 and fly long distances, it struggled in close combat. Poor visibility from the cockpit, bad low-speed handling, and the black smoke pouring from its engines made it an easy target. And the MiG-21 pilots used smart tactics, flying low to avoid radar, sneaking up on Phantoms, firing off their heat-seeking Atoll missiles, and then using tight turns to escape. Time after time, the MiG's agility proved deadly. That's why the US went back to the drawing board, and out of those lessons, the F-16 was born. From August 1967 to February 1968, US aircraft losses in Vietnam were staggering. The US lost 18 planes while only shooting down five. For a country used to dominating the skies, something was seriously wrong. The MiG-21's introduction in 1966 changed the game and forced the US to rethink its air strategy. Large, heavy US fighter bombers were powerful, but they weren't suited to fight small, agile, and much cheaper Soviet-built MiGs. To figure out what was going wrong, the US military commissioned the Red Baron study. This study dug deep into the technical and tactical reasons behind the heavy losses in Vietnam. The study's findings became the starting point for one of the most successful fighters in aviation history, a jet designed with a brand new, physics-based doctrine at its heart. Entering service in 1978, this fighter has stood the test of time. The plane was shaped by a once-classified 1966 paper filled with advanced math, graphs, and simulations, all trying to answer one question. How do you win a close-range dogfight? This paper formed the basis of a new idea called energy maneuverability. That concept came from Colonel John Boyd, a Vietnam veteran and legendary Air Force pilot. With the help of civilian mathematician Thomas Christie, Boyd created a new way of measuring a fighter's performance using physics. It changed how jets were designed forever. Their system used graphs to track how a fighter performs across speeds and turn rates. What they discovered was a new way of managing a jet's energy, both kinetic, speed, and potential altitude. Every time a fighter turns, it trades energy. If it does that trade efficiently, it can outmaneuver anything. That's the essence of energy maneuverability. The goal? Build a jet that could keep its energy longer than its enemy. And the F-16 was the result of that philosophy. The F-16 can pull off a full 360 degree turn in just 25 seconds. The F-4 takes 36 seconds to complete the same move. That's an 11 second difference. 11 seconds where one jet can get behind the other. In a dogfight, that's everything. The F-16 wasn't just a new plane, it was a whole new way of thinking. You can even see that thinking in the way its engine inlet was designed to handle airflow at supersonic speeds. It's a subtle feature, but it tells a deeper story about the jet's purpose. In reality, very little air combat ever happened at speeds above Mach 2, and it didn't have much tactical value. So when John Boyd and his team were designing what would become the F-16, they asked a crucial question. Where will future dogfights actually take place? Their answer? Somewhere between Mach 0.8 and Mach 1.2. That range, right around transonic speeds, is where real dogfights happen, and that's where the F-16 needed to dominate. So they optimized the jet's performance specifically for that range. That philosophy even shows up in the engine inlets. On older jets, like the F-4 Phantom, the inlets are mounted further back and have long cheek extensions. These were designed to create and manage shockwaves at high speed. That inlet design helps attach a shockwave right at the lip of the inlet. The shockwave then travels along the aircraft body, slowing the air before it reaches the engine, that's important, because if supersonic air hits the turbine, it can destroy the engine. Jet engines are built to handle subsonic airflow only, so you need that shockwave to slow the air down, gradually transitioning it from supersonic to subsonic. That happens across what's called a normal shock, inside the inlet, just before the fan face. Now contrast that with the F-16's design. It has what's called a pitot-style inlet, a flat-faced air scoop mounted directly under the nose. It doesn't have the same complex shock management system as the F-4 because it doesn't need it. That's because the F-16 was never meant to cruise at Mach 2. It was meant to fight smart, stay agile, and win where it counts, right in the heart of the transonic regime. Unlike jets like the F-4, F-15, F-14, MiG-29, or Su-27, which all have intakes set back from the nose to generate strong, oblique shock waves, the F-16 has a much simpler setup. 
Those older jets were designed to fly fast, with inlets optimized for speeds well above Mach 1.5. The F-16 does have a small overhang and nose shape to help attach a shock wave at the inlet, but it's not designed to be efficient beyond Mach 1.2. That's okay, because even though the F-16 can fly faster, its engine has to work harder to do so. Meanwhile, jets like the F-4 and F-15 are just hitting their stride at those higher speeds. This focus on agility at subsonic and transonic speeds shows up in other parts of the F-16 too. Take the intake placement, it's right under the fuselage, not on the sides like the F-4. And the wings? They're thin, sharply swept, and blend right into the body, with extensions called leading edge streaks just ahead of them. That underbelly intake helps the engine breathe better during tight, high angle of attack maneuvers. The aircraft's forward fuselage actually helps funnel clean air straight into the intake. But this clever design caused a new set of problems, especially during takeoff and landing. For example, the air intake sits just about a meter off the ground. That's really low. Placing the landing gear ahead of it could kick debris straight into the engine. Not ideal. But the wings are so thin and aerodynamically refined, they couldn't hold the gear either. So the designers tucked the main landing gear right behind the intake. To make sure the jet could land safely and stay stable, the gear uses a clever folding mechanism. It swings outward to widen the stance during landing, giving the plane a solid, stable wheelbase. During the F-16's development, General Dynamics explored a canard configuration. They tested various shapes and setups, some with no strakes, others with different types of canards, using subscale models in wind tunnels. These tests focused on the F-16's optimum maneuvering speeds, between Mach 0.4 and 0.8. The objective was clear, maximize lift while minimizing drag at high angles of attack. Engineers produced detailed graphs comparing how each configuration performed. As the design neared finalization, General Dynamics consulted NASA to refine the aerodynamic profile. NASA identified one key change, the sharpness of the wing's leading edge. General Dynamics had initially rounded it, weakening the high angle vortices. NASA advised sharpening it to strengthen those vortices, vital for stability and maneuverability. The final result was the now iconic F-16 design, with its long, blended leading edge strakes sweeping into the wing route. This not only improved performance, it created enough internal space to house the F-16's hidden firepower, the M-61 Vulcan 20mm rotary cannon. You can spot the muzzle tucked into the fuselage just left of the pilot. This subtle detail hints at the raw power inside the lightweight jet. The inclusion of a cannon was no afterthought. It was a direct lesson from Vietnam and the Red Baron report. The F-4 Phantom had struggled in close-range dogfights. With no internal gun, it was forced to rely on missiles, which were often unreliable at short distances. Eventually, the F-4 was retrofitted with an underbelly M-61 Vulcan. But the F-16 came with it as standard, built in from day one. The M-61 Vulcan is a smaller cousin to the A-10's GAU-8, a Avenger. It may fire smaller rounds, but its impact is no less dramatic. With six barrels rotating at up to 16 revolutions per second, the gun fires a blistering 100 rounds of 20 milliliters ammo per second. The F-16's gun is highly precise in both air-to-air -air and ground attacks. Its unstable design, controlled by a fly-by-wire system, gives it extreme agility while limiting G-forces to 9 and angle of attack to 26 degrees. With a reclined seat and side stick, the jet is built to keep pilots safe, aware, and in control. The F-16 may be over 45 years old, but it still holds its ground in modern air combat. Since its first flight in 1975, aviation has seen huge leaps, stealth, sensors, and networked warfare. The F-16 was built to push the limits of maneuverability, not just for aircraft, but for the pilots flying them. Its agility, speed, and fly-by-wire control make it a legend. That's why, even decades later, the world's most powerful air force plans to keep it flying through 2048. It's a timeless warplane, trusted to deliver when it counts. If you like this video, then make sure to like and subscribe. And with that, I'll see you in the next one.